Thank you for sticking around for the, uh, the last panel of the day. We're going to, um, I've counseled everyone to be very energetic and get into lots of arguments so that we'll keep you guys awake. Uh, I'm Jesse Isinger. I'm a reporter at ProPublica, which is a nonprofit investigative news organization. And um, I, I don't really do introductions. That's what the panel, um, that's what the, uh, you know, the, the materials are for. So I think what we're going to do on this panel today is solve all the questions that have been raised uh, earlier. Um, we're going to figure everything out. Uh, uh, there's going to be some overlap in questions. And then I think what we want to do really is kind of push the, uh, forward. So um, to my right, I've got a, uh, some esteemed antitrust economists who are going to kind of try to address the question of how do we measure um, these markets? How do we think about uh, market power? And then we're going to talk uh, more about, um, with folks on my left, about what, what the problems really are here. Um, and then we're going to try to come up with some actual solutions and discuss what's feasible and what isn't. So Carl and Fiona, would you take it away with um, your, your opening remarks? Sure. Um, so what we uh, thought we'd talk about for a little while is the issue of market definition, market power, and then what I referred to in the morning as the kind of anti-competitive theory of harm, which you would actually need if you wanted to bring some enforcement action under the antitrust law. So market definition traditionally works as follows. Uh, we think about a hypothetical market and ask if we raised price by, let's say, 5%, would enough consumers leave that they would defeat that price increase and make it unprofitable, or would that be a profitable thing to do? So we could say, let's imagine online advertising is our market. If prices went up in online advertising by 5%, would those advertisers leave for television or billboards or uh, some other alternative way of getting to people. Um, we also would want to think about the other side of the platform, namely the consumers. So let's say I'm on Facebook and we raise price to consumers by 5%. Well, what is that? You might say they're not paying anything. Well, remember, they're giving their data. So we think about that as the price and we'd say, suppose they had to give 5% more data or they lost 5% in terms of privacy protection or something like that. Would that drive those consumers to a different social media site? And we could do the same thing with search engines. If uh, online, you know, if advertising an online search engine uh, for a hypothetical monopolist, so Google and Bing put together, uh, DuckDuckGo in there, if that went up by 5%, would, uh, would advertisers go somewhere else? And similarly with uh, the consumer side, if the consumer is giving up some kind of quality or privacy. Once we have those markets set, let's imagine their online search is one and we find that online advertising is another, then your traditional way of assessing market power would be something like market shares. And this morning we've heard shares in the high 60s to 70s to 90s. Those are all sufficiently high shares that, that one would conclude that there was market power if, if you had that kind of market definition. So that's, that's a, just a quick overview of, kind of, of sort of the way you start. All right, let me pick up on that. I think um, it's very important. We're, we're primarily talking about Google and Facebook for this conversation. We can bring, we'll bring in Amazon as well, the other uh, company that's gotten a lot of attention today. Uh, and as, some of, as many of you, I'm sure, have heard, you know, we, economists, we often call these, these two-sided markets, although I don't like that term. But we've got the users, and then we've got the advertisers, right? So the other group that I would say we want to pay attention to in terms of economic power here, and defining markets would be the entities that want to be found, okay, when you're searching. Because if, if, if you're worried about search bias on Google, for example, if the algorithm is biased against, you know, your, your, uh, your site, then you're going to be disadvantaged, even if you're not an advertiser or a user. Okay, so there's, those are the constituencies. Um, and I think Fiona has pointed out that the traditional market definition exercise we could do either by looking at the consumer side or the advertiser side. You were really talking about both. Um, so I think that's important. The, you heard from uh, some of our distinguished antitrust colleagues this morning, um, I think in Kevin Murphy and, and, and Dennis Carl and Dick Schmalzi, 
uh, often what we antitrustors do is say, oh, we've seen this before, right? We've, we've, we've had these problems before. We've had these issues before. And I tend to fall into that too, but not, I don't, not to say, oh, so there's nothing new under the sun or not to worry about it, but there is learning we can have. So for example, DOJ for many years handled radio mergers, okay? And they had the advertising side and the listener side. Okay, credit cards is another area that's got a lot of attention where you've got the merchant side and the cardholder side. So this is, these are different. I'm not saying they're the same, but there's learning, both academic and case law and practitioner, that can be brought to bear on these two sides. The only other thing I'd say on the market definition piece is um, we also look at price, what we call price discrimination markets. So it, we can look for market power over particular groups. So I'm sure Facebook would say, oh, not only do we not have any market power, more or less, on the user side, because people can spend their time so many different ways, as Zuckerberg more or less said in Congress, I guess, but I could imagine them saying, I don't know, that they'd say, oh, we also don't have market power on the advertising side because advertisers run these campaigns and they sprinkle their advertising money around in all these different ways, and we have to compete against all these other outlets for advertising. Okay, not a crazy argument, and a fairly standard argument when was talking about advertising markets. Um, and, and, and then where the analysis tends to go would be, well, maybe there are certain targeted types of advertisers who, where Facebook is really a lot more effective way of getting to customers because they're targeted. And they would know that. And the advertisers might very well know that based on the campaigns they're running. So then we can have targeted or price discrimination markets, and we might be concerned about harm in those narrower groupings. Okay? But I think as we move on from market definition and market power to more conduct and what we do about it, I think for this conversation, I would just say, let's just stipulate, assume, whatever, that Facebook and Google have significant market power in some of these areas, and then go on to see uh, significant economic power. What can or should antitrust do about that? Mm -hmm. And I would just add, I think you could, inter it would be interesting to pursue the price discrimination market on the consumer side also. I don't know quite how that would go, but I think that's a really interesting area. Okay. And part of what we've been talking about prepping in here is, is trying to think like theories that haven't really been developed in terms of market power or in terms of possible conduct um, uh, to think where, where, might it, where might this all, all go in antitrust land with these big tech platforms? Uh, because we have some, some things that have happened already, but we're looking forward. Yeah. Uh are we stipulating, Carl, for uh, the purposes of argument, or are we stipulating because you believe it that Google, fa um, Facebook, and Amazon have market power that is concerned? <laughs> well, you know, you lump them all together like that. It's so hard to answer. This is the, the classic <laughs> antitrust economist trick. Um, uh, to we have disaggregate. a little more. Yeah. Can we keep going? Okay, you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You keep going, so, and then okay, we'll so talk about it. Okay. So once you have uh, this basis, then you would ask, well, can you use the antitrust laws to uh, go after these firms? And the answer is, well, you can if they've committed a violation of those antitrust laws, um, not just because they're big or they did something you don't like. So the question then comes, do we need some new antitrust law for that? And the answer is no, not in principle. The antitrust laws are written in a general enough way. They prohibit mergers that tend to lessen competition and exclusionary conduct. And those apply in every sector of the economy, and they apply here. So what I uh, mentioned this morning is what we just haven't really seen out in the literature is a nice, tight theory of harm that says, here's the conduct, and here's the way in which it harms competition, and that's why it's a violation of the antitrust laws. And that's what you would need before you could bring just a traditional, ordinary enforcement case uh, against one of these platforms. And if, if you break it up into the two areas, uh, mergers and then conduct, or, or bad behavior, bad conduct. We, we've talked a bit, I think we'll talk some more about, it's totally possible, you know, we, I can see antitrust doing more, and I've actually written that I would hope antitrust would do more to prevent large incumbent companies, including tech companies, from buying smaller companies that are threats before those threats mature. Okay? It's a hard thing to do in practice, it's a hard thing to do in the case law, but it's totally within the realm of how, you know, there are cases like that, and, and we can move, in, and you know, people talk about Facebook's acquisitions, and you know, we obviously talk about WhatsApp or Instagram, so have they, you know, so we can talk about that sort of thing, that's one whole area. Um, uh, 
the other would be the conduct. And I, I've been asking people for a good year or two since, since this hole has been bubbling up, all right, tell me what you think the conduct is with any of these companies. Tell me what it is. And then we could talk about, does that seem like an antitrust violation, or it could be, or should it be investigated? And I haven't gotten that much, OK? Um, I hear a lot, look, I'm pretty unhappy with Facebook right now, but I haven't heard anything that sounded like a real antitrust violation. Except for, except for the mergers. No, I'm, I'm talking about the conduct side right. now, right. OK? And on conduct, I think it's really important to distinguish two types of concerns we'd have. One would be the company uses its monopoly position to leverage that and somehow take over adjacent spaces, okay? And the EC case against Google, I, I do work for Google, uh, I work for Google on that case, uh, is claiming that Google took its main search monopoly and used it to take over or stifle competition in an adjacent market for comparison shopping services. Okay, I, mean, I think the case is very weak, but it's that type of leverage extension argument. And that's one thing. But a lot of the talk today has been about what are we going to do about the core monopoly or po power that these companies have? And to go after that sort of case, we would traditionally look for is there conduct where there's a competitor who's threatening to come in and, and challenge or attack that monopoly position, and the company has somehow excluded them or stiff-armed them to disable that. And um, uh, this is what we had in Microsoft case, actually. It wasn't about the cases that actually played out. It was not Microsoft leveraging its monopoly power to take over browsers. Actually, that was part of the case that was brought, but that didn't end up, that wasn't where the case ended up. as a tying case. Uh, that was part of the case, but that part the appeals court didn't like. The part that stood up and is an important precedent now is Microsoft defending its desktop operating system monopoly through certain conduct. Okay, so that would be the big case against one of these companies that could warrant substantial remedy if they were seen to unfairly exclude competitors who could have toppled the monopoly. So I continue, I will repeat my plea or request, what are those conduct, any of these companies, tell me what it is, and then, you know, and tell the antitrust agencies for that matter, and that's where we would go, and that's pretty much what antitrust could do, that and of course the acquisition side, the M&A side. And what's particularly um, important about these platforms is very often they have direct network effects. So if you think about Google, uh, you're on, uh, sorry, if you think about Facebook, you're on there to communicate with your friends. That effectively means that there's a winner-take-all market and nobody wants to be on a social network where, where their friends are not, okay, that's pretty boring. And so what you're going to see is competition for the market, not competition in the market. Okay? So there's going to be co competition to become that monopolist uh, that everyone coordinates on. And you're not going to see two social networks with 50% share. At least maybe the teenagers are all on one and then the old people are all on another one. But, uh, but you're not going to have the teenagers dividing up. So what does that mean for antitrust enforcement? It means, I think, going back to what Carl said about these Facebook acquisitions of small, threatening competitors, that's very important. You wouldn't expect to see a merger, you wouldn't expect to see Facebook buying a competitor that had a 30% share. There's no such thing. You know, in a, in a market with, with strong network externalities, the competitor has a 1% share or a 99% share. So we are going to need to pay attention to those 1% share companies because they actually are the source of competition in that, kind of, in that kind of market. And then the last one we wanted to talk about was Amazon. What theories have we heard out there about Amazon that would fall into this antitrust bucket? And I think one is monopsony. I don't know if you want to. Right. So, but before we jump to that, the, 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 the one theory that's been developed is, is predatory pricing, basically, that they're, you know, and we've heard, you know, we certainly heard from folks this morning, uh, you know, are they driving at other retailers with low prices? Or on the, then, but then on the supplier side, are they squeezing you know, the book publishers or the music industry? Okay, that would be some sort of upstream buyer power. Okay. As far as I can see, the, the predatory pricing type of case downstream, uh, I'm not seeing it from anything I've seen, but I don't see the, the evidence that their prices are below cost. And I don't see that they tend to have that big a share in various markets downstream, but I'm open to that evidence. I know people disagree about that. I think the upstream stuff is more um, potentially could go somewhere. 
but the antitrust, yeah, we'd have fairly you know, demanding standards, I guess, to have an antitrust case, which would be what would be the upstream market they're buying. Is it, on, is it online retailers through their marketplace who could only get to the market through Amazon? And what about eBay, for example? Or other, what about other, online, other retailers? So um, you know, Walmart's making a big play. So I just don't know where that would go in terms of the facts. Um, the fact that they're big and growing is not enough. But um, again, uh, I think it'd be interesting that people could develop the fact base on the theory of harm, um, and on the upstream side, uh, you know, the monopsony power side, if you will, with with the with the key thing being not just that they bargain for low prices from their suppliers, which in and of itself is not, but that, that there would be some output restricting uh, fact over time. Uh, because they'd squeeze suppliers, you know, such as was suggested in the music industry, for example, uh, and when that could be tested. And I think another way you could think about the output restriction, which I haven't seen developed, but would be an interesting direction if the facts were there, is if Amazon's going to take a supplier and kind of expropriate their investments in something, their new toaster or whatever, uh, then that might lead to insufficient investments in new goods. I, I don't want to be a retailer that invents something great to sell through the Amazon website because they're going to see it, take it over, do it themselves, and I won't be able to reap the rewards of my innovation or something like that. So there's that dynamic kind of harm as well as what you were just talking about, which is you know lower prices and, and kind of static benefits. Okay, so we're going to wrap up our little intro here and <laughs> yeah. turn it back to everybody. But I, I think to me the t one takeaway I'd hope you'd all uh, get is. There are lines of inquiry to be pursued, theories of harm, evidence that can be accumulated in all, any of these companies. Um, I haven't seen that really developed yet. But antitrust is a tough way to go. You have to have these elements, and you make the case, and it takes a long time, and the case law is not necessarily very favorable to some of these theories. Um, and a lot of what I think the concerns that we've heard today, and we'll probably hear tomorrow, are not fundamentally antitrust, right? They're political or there are other issues about how the role in our society. And so just don't expect more of antitrust than the type of things we're talking about here, which have to do with competition and monopolization. Um, all right, thank you guys. Um, so we have a, uh, a plea for a theory of harm. Um, and uh, and it, careful students of this panel will have noticed that um, Originally, it was had a different title. It was going to be called uh, something about how is free really free, um, and uh, and Andre said that's an incredibly boring title because I didn't quite say um, because <laughs> uh, everybody knows it's completely obvious it's not free. Uh, end of discussion. Uh, we all go to for drinks, um, and uh, so. I think we're going to talk about market failures and um, uh, theories of harm here in the next half. Uh, so Andre, take it away. Um. Sure. So Jay and I are going to talk about market failures. Um, at, as a general, like as general perspective, I think of multi-sided platforms. So all the ones that we mentioned, but you know, generally speaking, multi-sided platforms. There are two types of market failures. There are market failures that are contained within the platform, and there are market failures that basically spill over outside the platform. So let me explain what I mean. If you're a multi-sided platform, by definition, you're kind of like running a market, and you, in some sense, you're acting as a regulator for your own market. Except, of course, you're a for-profit regulator and you're trying to maximize profits. Now, in doing so, obviously, you want to take care. You want to make sure that the market functions properly. For instance, I want to make sure that sellers don't abuse buyers. Uh, if there's asymmetric information, I want to put mechanisms in place that uh, give the sellers the right incentives and protect buyers from sellers. And I think, by and large, all platforms, so Airbnb, Facebook, Google, uh, doesn't matter if it's buyers or sellers. It could be users and advertisers or users with third-party apps. There are always this potential for you know, one party to take advantage of the other. I think by and large, all of these platforms are pretty good at solving for these market failures. So these are the market failures that are internal to the platform. Now, I'm not saying it's easy. There's, you know, there's a fundamental struggle between I'm a platform. I don't fully control what the third parties are doing, but I may be held responsible. So let's say if, um, I don't know, if I have a bad experience on an Airbnb, I go to Air, some Airbnb apartment and it's a, it turns out to be a shack, it's not what I, what I ordered. Now I understand that Airbnb doesn't control that seller and they did whatever they could, but if it's a bad experience, 
I may still never go to Airbnb again, so I'm holding Airbnb responsible. So they have to kind of deal with that. So there's control versus responsibility. Now, that's already, you know, not, you know, it's not easy, but that's just talking about market, uh, market failures within the platform. I think what's come, like, become very prominent these days with what's going on with Facebook is that there are very severe market failures that spill over outside the platform. So this is transactions or interactions that happen on the platform that have consequences, you know, outside the platform, outside the platform scope. <laughs> that one's a lot tougher because if I'm the platform, it's unclear. In fact, it's actually pretty clear that they don't have incentives to really take care or to, you know, to even worry about market failures outside the platform. So this is the, um, I mean, the Facebook over the last two years, it was, this was incredible to me. They would repeatedly say, we're just a platform. How could you hold us responsible for, you know, I don't know, results of elections or stuff that's happening outside? Now, it's clear they're an enabler, so I get the argument. Right? I mean, this is the, what's different about platform the businesses. I'm not fully controlling. I'm just enabling something. Now, they're enabling something that has negative consequences. So in the case of Facebook, maybe it's... Uh, misinformation. In the case of Airbnb, the outside market failure could be something like, um, so I know the impact, so the, the overall rents in a city go up and it displaces people who work in that city. So that's something a lot of cities are worried about and they're talking to Airbnb about this. Each of these platforms does have these kind of market failures that spill outside. And I think the issue there is that these market, so these market failures are not internalized. I mean, the business model of these platforms is not attuned to account for these market failures until someone says something about it. Now, Keeping regulators aside for a second, I still think it's very, my, it's extremely myopic, and as Facebook discovered to their sorrow, it's very myopic to basically just be completely, you know, uh, just focus on what they're doing on the platform and not care at all about what's going on outside, you know, what, what, what results from uh, the spillovers from their platform. Because at some point, if something bad happens, like say, I don't know, election scandal or something like that, well, now everyone, public opinion turns against them and we go to the other extreme in which they're held responsible for absolutely everything. Which I don't think, by the way, I don't think that's fair either. I mean, again, they don't have full control, but you end up with this problem that Facebook has now, which is basically anything they do, every, you know, every bad action that's kind of correlated or stems from their platform, they're held responsible for it. So now the question, so this was more strategy, like you have to worry about this if you're a platform. Now, what's, you know, what's the regulatory standpoint? I think this is actually tricky. So we, you know, of course we want to worry about market failures that are not internalized. You, textbook well, we can't, 101 example is um, factory polluting the river, right? So you know, they, they produce something, it, it spills into the river and you know, it's bad, we tax it. For example, one solution is we tax the, the, tax the output. With platforms it's a little bit trickier because again, there's, they're too st they, they don't have full control over all the actions they are responsible for the negative harm. So I think a regulated response that says, okay, there are these market failures, we're just gonna hold you responsible for anything that stems from your actions outside the platform. I, I don't think that's the right answer. I mean, there should be some accountability and some responsibility, and there should be, I mean, you should definitely ask these, uh, ask these questions, to what extent should we hold these platforms uh, responsible for stuff that's spilling, out, spilling outside, but it's definitely a lot harder than, say, for traditional product and service companies. So I don't have, like, I don't have a good answer for what the, you know, the percentage responsibility is, but I definitely think it's something, just like, for example, after a while we decide, okay, well, tobacco is bad for you, we should, you know, we basically start to put some restrictions, I mean, disclosure rules on the, on the, on the harms of tobacco. You know, I definitely envision something like this for, for Facebook. You know, you should be aware that you know, consuming Facebook more than three hours a day makes you stupid. I mean, if there's research, I mean, there's, by the way, I think there, there's actually like sociological, psychological research on this. I mean, if we found, find that that's truly the case, I mean, I think there should be something like that. But I tread very careful in trying to sort of give full responsibility for these market failures um, to the platforms. Let me, let me pause here. And okay, to, good. To um, well, you have an hour and four minutes to come up with your solution. I, <laughs> right, I'm cool. not going to let you off with, okay. uh, uh, we, we want a regulatory solution. Right, um, cool. uh, Jay, do you want to elaborate on uh, the failures that you see in the markets? Yeah, sure. So we talked a lot about uh, Facebook and Google. And as we know, uh, the business model for these two firms is to provide the services for free and get revenues from elsewhere, especially uh, from, from advertising. So I'll talk about uh, some of the uh, market failures in this kind of a business model. And also we talk a lot about uh, market power of these two companies. But actually, the uh, market failure I'm going to talk about, this will be actually independent of a market structure. Okay? Even though there are many, many firms, this kind of problem will still, still exist. And the reason is the problem. So I'll, at least I think of uh, two 
uh, main reasons for market failure in this type of market. The first one is that users and the consumers, they pay with uh, attention and the personal information. And we know that actually uh, for proper functioning of the market economy, one necessary condition is that when the transacting parties, okay, they should know what they are exchanging exactly. But when you pay with, with uh, personal information, actually you don't know how much you pay because the process, uh, your information will be, will be used by, by these firms. This is very opaque and non-transparent. Okay? So this is uh, one uh, issue uh, because the, the information asymmetry, how your information will be used, that could lead to, to, to market failure. And also uh, another complication is that even though consumers uh, know that how your information might be used, it looks like there seems to be some cognitive dissonance in, in, in the following sense. So people are asked how much you value privacy. People will say that well, we value a lot. But when you actually see how they behave, they seem to, their behavior seems to, to, to indicate otherwise. So this could be also another I mean, uh, consideration we have, to take in, we have to think about. And another one is uh, there could be also some kind of information externality. Uh, in the morning, there was some, some discussion about uh, information, I mean, the privacy is actually similar to, to pollution. So here what I'm saying is that even though you guard your own information, but if many, many other people uh, reveal their information, actually there's some, some uh, technology called like a doppelganger uh, method, which is basically firms that can use big data and uh, artificial intelligence. They can match whatever information you provide. They can find somebody else who might have a similar characteristics and may uh, have some information about you. So if all other people actually reveal information that actually the firm will eventually find out about yourself, so maybe I mean, you will be more willing to, 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 to provide uh, your own information. So there could be, it could be also some kind of a collective uh, uh, decision problem might be, might, be, might be present. And the second uh, related reason is that personal data is information. And as economists, we know that information is a very special property, which is actually public in nature, which means that information can be used over and over again without wear and tear. And also, if you sell your information, it can be also sold and resold at infinitum. So I see some kind of like a, a analogy with actually a technology licensing. So technology licensing is a sale of uh, information. And when you look at actually licensing contract, I mean, the contract can be very elaborate because you, do, you are aware of this kind of uh, problem. So you actually put a lot of uh, restrictions on the contract. For instance, I mean, you could put in something like a field of use restriction. So basically, they limit uh, only a particular, particular purpose, so not something else. Also, if we are concerned that maybe the licensee might develop better technology that, that will make your, your technology obsolete, then maybe you can include the so-called grant back clause. Okay. So there could be a lot of uh, restrictions in, in, in the, in the uh, uh, contract because of this information problem. But we cannot, I mean, but, but technology licenses <coughs> are taking place between uh, large uh, corporations. I mean, they can afford the lawyers and also they could have a dedicated IT department. We cannot I mean, expect that kind of uh, uh, sophistication from, from mass consumers I mean, when, when they give up the information. So I think that this could be another, another issue, issue uh, in, in, in the, in the, in the uh, market economy. Now then, identifying problem might be easy, but uh, what would be a solution? I mean, this could be a more, more difficult problem. Uh, one thing I'd like to mention is that I mean, we talk a lot about uh, government intervention in regulation, but I think there should be also some kind of like a technological uh, solution to, to, to this problem. I mean, if you remember, like in 1990s, there was a lot of discussion about piracy. And at that time, I mean, all people thought that actually the music industry, it is the end of the world, okay? But somehow, I mean, they survived. Of course, there was uh, some uh, high profile cases where actually music companies were going after uh, college students and it became, I mean, being used. But there's also another technological solution, which is something called like a digital rights management. I'm, I'm not saying this is the, the, the I mean, a perfect solution, but well, let's say take an example like uh, Spotify. Okay, so if you are a premium uh, subscriber, probably I mean, you can download the music on your your uh, phone, and actually you can use it offline. Okay, but once you discontinue your service, 
maybe you cannot play it anymore. So in other words, there is some kind of a technology that will make, make that kind of, a, uh, in a sense, I mean, make the information of a sleep. Okay? I don't know whether this kind of technology can, can, can be, can be uh, uh, developed to, to minimize it, uh, the kind of information problem we are, we, are, we are talking about. So basically, making information less durable. I mean, that could be another, another uh, route we can think about. Uh, Andre, why, why don't we come back to you, because okay. this leads into Sarit's point, I think, which is um, maybe these companies aren't in such a durable market position. Maybe there is a technological solution. Uh, you've been doing some thinking about that. Um, and before I leave it to you, I want you guys to think about whether um, Carl and Fiona are sort of fun fundamentally right about uh, the harm here not being a question of market position, but really a question of kind of the, the firm's off product offerings and their, their data and their market position rather than, and so it, do you agree with them fundamentally that this really kind of isn't an antitrust question, but well, I'll come back to that. So is there some kind of, are these actually, is there a technological solution on the horizon that could destabilize these companies? So uh, I'm not going to talk about technological solution that uh, Jay was thinking about, but uh, what I'm thinking about, and this is something that actually came up uh, early this morning, is this idea of uh, decentralized apps. And uh, when you're thinking about the blockchain technology that is becoming more and more pop uh, popular, um, many are talking about how the idea of decentralization that the blockchain technology is going to allow us, is going to enable customers to actually own their own data. And then when I own my own data, I can really think about who am I going to give it to and how much I'm going to charge for it or what, I'm go what do I want to get in return. And that, um, that in a way also going to help us uh, touch on the discussion that uh, Joshua was talking about before in terms of um, do we actually, so when we're thinking about value creation, when we're thinking about these platforms, are they actually really creating value? And um, if consumers would not feel or do not feel that they're creating value, then we're going to see them switching very quickly to other alternatives that are going to allow them to control their data. But if you're thinking about Uber, for example, I think that Uber is a great example of uh, an app that our, um, an intermediary, that is really matching the drivers and riders. And this is something that we can do with an open source app that um, where if we're doing it on the blockchain technology, it's going to be relatively easy to do. But then what this open source app, what this intermediary not going to be able to allow us or is not going to offer, the service that is not going to offer is, is not going to tell us whether our driver is actually a serial killer or not. They are not going to do some due diligence on their drivers so that um, the hopefully current uh, ride-sharing uh, um, uh, intermediaries are, are doing. So there is some value that these apps, that these intermediaries are uh, providing, whether it's organizing the internet or uh, whether it's um, you, you know doing a better job in terms of the matching when we're thinking about Google, for example. Um, and then the, once you open it with the technologies that are now available and are going to again, you know, become more and more, more and more popular, um, we're going to see that we're going to be able to do a lot of this matching, but the question is whether this is going to offer the, the same value that the current companies are actually offering, and that's going to help us also measure what is the value that these companies are, that these intermedi intermediaries are actually creating uh, nowadays for customers. Um, okay, great. So. Uh, Fiona, Carl, I want to ask you guys um, the question that I asked Macon Delrahim at lunch, um, which is uh, he he had a cry sort of similar to you, which uh, Carl, you know, I want to see some evidence here. Um, and why do we not have the evidence that you're talking about? With um, uh, why do we not have the evidence that would uh, provide a theory of harm um, from these companies. Is it because they're not um, exploiting their market position? 
Um, and in fact, so they're not creating some kind of market harm, that the only harms are you know, privacy violations. Is it because um, economists are not asking these questions for some reason? Are they, uh, because it wasn't um, a popular subject until only recently? Is it because they're getting, um, uh, are they captured in some way? Um, uh, why do we not have the, um, the evidence that we need to assess whether these companies are abusive? I think if you look historically at antitrust cases, major antitrust cases, they come from, uh, in the United States, the agencies doing deep, rather long investigations with subpoena power. And the European Commission would be the same. They have been doing it for quite as long, maybe 25 or 30 years versus 100 years. And so it's, um, it's asking a lot to say academics, let's say, to do a study and uncover some of the stuff because it's, it's pretty detailed and it tends to be confidential information. That's right. It's, you know, how are we supposed to know what's going on with Facebook's acquisitions and the motiv motivations for those and the modeling behind them and the thought behind them? as an outside person. I mean, I think that's just not reasonable to imagine is happening. Look, so on acquisitions, you, you know, people do raise questions when they come up because those are public, okay? But to do the detailed analysis, you usually need, you need basically confidential information. That's what the agencies have, are able to do under the Hart Scott Rodino Act. For, for conduct cases, I would take Amazon. Okay, so first, my first question would be, well, are they pricing stuff below cost systematically? Okay. I don't know what their costs are. I don't know, how do I do that, right? You'd have to go into their data, I think, to test that. What's their market share in different areas? Are they getting so much market share? Even measuring market share can be pretty hard, okay? So, and then some of the other modes of conduct, um, well, we haven't really heard exactly what they were, but even the Google stuff that I've worked on, like I said, you know, it's pretty detailed, all right? What are the policies and how was the advertising, you know, sold and, and uh, I mean, you know, Yelp, for example, has put out some, some interesting stuff about Google, you know, that's suggestive. And I think that's, that's one example of evidence. I mean, Luther Lowe is here, I think, and he's done a great job with that. So, so there are examples of that. In that case, it's another you know, company in the same space who's, who's aware of the impact and has done some studies. Um, but I think you really have to expect it's, it's something the antitrust agencies will do, or occasionally private actions, you know, private, private plaintiffs who can bring cases. But you need, uh, you need to dig in and get, and, and it's, it's, it's at that level of detail. And so to answer your question specifically, do we think there's no evidence because there's no harm? I think we haven't looked, so it's premature to say we know whether there's harm. I think economists are asking, and maybe some are captured, but most are not and are interested. Um, but I think that what Del Rahim's answer really pointed out was that he seems to think we're in a, he's in a circle where he wants us to come up with the evidence so that he can open an investigation, but opening an investigation would be the way you would get the evidence. And mm -hmm. so if he's waiting for us to deliver him the evidence, we're kind of stuck. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. nothing's going to happen if that's mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. how he imagines this is going. But co complaining companies are, are a way to get to break through that, right? I mean, uh, that's, uh, they, you know, both the DOJ and FTC, you know, always say, or we're open to hearing complaints. And of so, course, that doesn't mean they're going to swallow them whole, but they'll consider it. So let me ask a, a slightly sensitive question. Um, both of you served in the Obama administration. Why did the Obama administration not conduct more aggressive um, investigations with their subpoena power into these companies as they were rising to become much more powerful? <laughs> yeah. I'm a little safer than Carl because he was the first one uh, uh, in the job under Obama. I, I think what people um, don't fully appreciate is the state of antitrust enforcement when Obama took office. So I'll tell you one vignette. Apparently on the first day of the new administration, if you wanted to schedule a conference call, if you were DOJ and you wanted to schedule a conference call, you had to fax a request for your conference call to the conference call department 24 hours in advance of the time you wanted to hold the conference call. Okay, so we're not really talking about cutting edge frontier, let's worry about <laughs> Facebook issues. We're talking about 
can we get ourselves organized enough to really uh, enforce the law? And I think if you look at the reinvigoration of litigation under Christine Barney and then Joe Wayland and other people like that, and you look at the merger uh, track record of the Obama administration at the Department of Justice, it's 100%. Right. Every single merger challenge that was brought was won. So a lot of sort of change and, in my view, kind of more perfect, you know, the good stuff happened. Uh, maybe we didn't get all the way? Well, as much as I'd like to hide behind Fiona's answer, I will add to it. Um, uh, so in spring 2009, I went to DOJ, and, and Christine Barney was the first was the assistant attorney general. She was confirmed the next month in April. And one of her first things she did within weeks was she rescinded the report on Section 2 monopolization that had been put out at the end of the Bush administration by the Justice Department, which was seen in many as, as overly restrictive of what, uh, making it harder to bring Section 2 cases. So she rescinded that, which was notable, and she gave a speech which picked up the front page of the New York Times as, okay, Obama administration here, they're going to go after all these big companies. Okay. And um, let's just say about two weeks later, I gave a speech, much less noted for very good reason, I'm sure, where I presented the data on how many Section 2 cases the Justice Department had brought over the previous 20 years. Okay? And the answer was like less than one a year. Okay? And they're not even ones, I mean, some of them you wouldn't even heard of. They're Section 2 cases, but you know, one would be kind of a United local Regional Hospital yeah. of Wichita Falls. Yeah, right. Okay. So, so you know, they're Who not Who doesn't like remember Microsoft. that? Yeah, right. yeah. So I was basically saying, look, the reality is you don't end up with very many of these cases, and once a decade or so, maybe you have a big one, you know, an IBM or an AT&T or a Microsoft. But if you think the Justice Department is going to have a regular series of these, you're going to be disappointed. Now, we could ask whether that's a failure of enforcement, or not, but, but um, let's just say um, the DOJ gets a certain number of leads and they follow them and some of them don't pan out. We had a number of things we looked at quite closely that in the end up we didn't pursue, okay? Um, so uh, that, that's what I know. And I always say to people, look, if you are aware of some case you think we missed, tell me what it was, okay? Um, oh, so do you guys agree uh, to my left here uh, that, um, that these market failures that you've identified are sort of fundamentally not really questions of antitrust um, enforcement, that, they, uh, that they're something else? And, and, and if so, then uh, would be lead to regulation or, or, or not? Um, do you want to? So can I just talk about uh, one one issue? Yes, uh, you may. So, I'll talk about one uh, antitrust issue when uh, product is once again uh, free or or zero at zero price. So, I mean, this morning Piona mentioned about uh, potential negative price. Okay, so one issue with negative price is uh, something called uh, consumer's moral hazard. Actually, uh, in some market, actually we can find a negative price. For instance, in the credit card market, I'm sure that you all get the credit card with, with free annual membership, and also whenever you spend some money, you are going to get some rebate and also points. I mean, these can be considered as a negative price. But in the credit card market, actually, there is some uh, built-in mechanism uh, to prevent a moral hazard. And for instance, you are not going to spend $100 to get just a $1 rebate, okay? No one will be uh, that stupid. But imagine the case where actually Google pays you uh, some money for every search you do because they can get some advertising revenue. If that is the case, then uh, you will find some people sitting uh, in front of a computer all day long with, with random words. And also maybe they might uh, come up with some kind of software okay, to do automatically. So now think about the Google's business model. Google's business model is that when somebody type in some words to some query, that will reveal what kind of information, what kind of things uh, they want. Okay? So that is a, they can, how they can do to so-called targeted advertising. But once people are doing typing random numbers, random words, okay? so then basically no advertiser will be willing to pay. And basically the Google business model will just collapse. Okay? So there could be some restriction why a price cannot be, cannot be negative. 
And then this brings to uh, the issue of uh, tying and the bundling in this market. So I think this is appropriate to, to talk about here at Chicago School because Chicago School has very, I mean, a great insight about, about time. So consider, I mean, so this is something called the leverage theory of time. So basically when you have a monopoly in one market, whether you can, that, you can extend that monopoly power to, 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 to another market. And so in the previous panel session, we talked about a lot about this one. Okay, so now, the Chicago School, I mean, argument is the following. Okay, suppose that there are two products. Okay, the typical story is one firm has a monopoly power, let's say, in market A, but uh, the firm is facing competition in another product market B. Okay? So suppose that these two products are complementary, okay, meaning that consumers need both products. Otherwise, they will not get any, any utility. Okay, so if that is the case, then it is automatic that you can monopolize the, the second market. Okay, why? Because you are going to sell your monopolized product only on the condition consumers also buy product B. Okay? So then consumers cannot just buy product B. Okay? It is just useless. So you can, when two products are complementary, I mean you can automatically you can, you can extend your monopoly power. Okay? But the more interesting question is whether the firm, the monopoly will have actually incentive to do that. Okay, so that is a different question, and this is where the Chicago School uh, insight is coming in. Actually, the Chicago School says that, well, you can extend your monopoly power to the second market, but you will have no incentive to do that. Okay, so the, the logic is the following. Okay, if there is more competition in, let's say, private market B, okay, and let's say the price has gone down, okay, then as a result, actually, you can actually increase your monopolized product. So actually, you can get higher, higher, higher profit. Okay. So the more competition there, actually, actually, you are going to have a higher profit. So what is the mechanism here? The mechanism is what is called a price squeeze. Okay. Price squeeze means that you can just squeeze down the other product market, and you can drag up in the other market. But once the price is equal to zero, then there's nothing to depress, and also there's nothing to, to, to increase. So actually, in this kind of market, actually, the Chicago school, I mean, the, the, the inside, okay, this can actually, actually fail, and actually there could be some, some room for, for uh, incentive to, to, to bundle. And so I think this kind of be, uh, logic might be actually useful in actually the Google Android case. So Google Android case, actually, Android is uh, free software, but there is something called the MADA, which, is, uh, which stands for what? Mobile Application Distribution, distribution Agreement. So according to this uh, clause, well, if you install any uh, Google app, actually you have to install everything. Okay, so this is basically all or nothing uh, proposition. Okay, you cannot just select a few Google apps. You cannot do that. So either you install everything or you, you, cannot, you install nothing. So in the smartphone case, uh, what is really important is the Google Play Store, which is where you can actually download all the apps. Okay? If you cannot download the apps, then your phone is not smart anymore. Okay? So basically, I mean, this, this is the kind of like a proposition uh, given by, by the Google, and I think this might be actually some, some, some important implication. So just uh, um as an example, there is a browser that's called Brave that is um, offer, offering to pay you uh, for your searches. So it's doing exactly you know, the idea of these negative prices that uh, Fiona mentioned before. Um, and we don't see it being, uh, and they, are, they have all the stats to show you that they're going to be faster than any of the other browsers that are out there. Um, but we don't see a lot of adoption of it. And, and again, I think that it goes back to, it might be awareness issue, but it might be also the case that consumers just feel that um, the value proposition, that the value creation is, might, not be, uh, might not be high enough. And to uh, Jay's second point in terms of, um, in terms of you know, leveraging your, your, um, your market power, um, what we might see them doing is actually um, using this market power in order to increase the prices to the advertisers, right? So they're not, you, you know, we're not going to see the effect maybe on the consumer side, but there might be some effects going on on the advertiser side. Uh, side. And then, um, but I think that everybody is so focused on the consumer side that they might not be really thinking about the advertiser, advertiser side, where it might be the case that um, this is where, you know, the conduct might be. 
So, mm -hmm. yeah. Do you want to yeah. have something to add? Yeah. yeah, so I want to go back to your question about so antitrust versus other public policy issues. Yeah. I think they're both, I mean, they're both there. But I think just focusing on antitrust with these companies, I think, is really dangerous. I mean, there are certain market failures which I think were there, so, I mean, were there before they became big. Of course, all of these. So even the market failures, obviously, they're you know they're more of a concern when these companies become big. But I mean, there's a little parallel here, maybe, with the the financial crisis in the sense a lot of the um, as I was listening to Jay, a lot of the examples of market failures that we worry about with these platforms. There, they, have some, they have something to do with information disclosure, with basically being asymmetric information between the platform and how they operate and the general public. So do you fully understand when you sign up for Facebook? Like first of all, do you understand how much data you're giving them, what they're doing with the data? The answer is probably 90%. I have no clue what's happening. Uh, there was a very good example, an article a couple weeks ago. So basically, Facebook tried to defend themselves with um, saying, oh, but we had data policies. I mean, we weren't, we weren't just giving data left and right. We actually had policies that stipulated if you're a third-party advertiser or app on Facebook, and if you get data, which you know, if, you're an, if you're an app or advertiser on Facebook, you get data about users, our policy says you can only use that data, and I, I'm really quoting here, you can only use that data to, uh, to enhance your product or your service on top of Facebook. You can't use that data outside. That sounds reasonable. Except when you think about it, it's like, how exactly are you enforcing this? Like, where exactly is, like, okay, that sounds like a very good principle, but it's like, how is Facebook policing what I do with the data once I got it off Facebook? And this is exactly, obviously, the Cambridge Analytica case. It has no instruments. So to me, this is an example in which basically Facebook, at some point, they probably put that in there, said this should be enough to give us plausible deniability. And I'm sure they, because people don't really understand how this works. I mean, they, I don't think they fully understood themselves, but probably more than the general public. So to me, it has to, I mean, there has to be, I mean, I, 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 right now, I would just worry about, they, they should be held to high standards in terms of explaining exactly what's happening. I, I just don't think people understand exactly how this is being, uh, how data is being used, and I think that's kind of, well, that's one of the main issues. And I don't think that's necessary, I mean, it's, it's in addition and somewhat orthogonal to antitrust, to market structure. Yeah. I just want to echo that. It seems to me that we're all learning how, how much of our data is being used and all the things that can be done when it's combined through all these different sources. We heard some pretty scary, and before we even get to being manipulated, okay? So this, I think that, and I think of this as a consumer protection issue more than an antitrust issue, or at least right. in the first instance, a consumer protection issue. Yeah. So I, I, it seems to me there's a lot to be said for educating the public about what is now possible with the with their data and so are you really okay with that yeah okay and if that happens then i would hope there'd be demand for either these big incumbent companies or perhaps entrants to cater to people like no agree. that's creepy i don't want that yeah. anymore agree give me an option agree uh but the market isn't working there yet because the demand isn't there yet because people will sell so much yeah. you know they're giving away this data for a nickel or an eighth of a penny i heard <laughs> whatever it's worth and um, I think we all need to be thinking and telling people, yeah. do you want to do that anymore? So something that hasn't come up so much in this conference, which I think is really important, is all the work that's been done over the last 25 years in behavioral economics. Yes. Because some of what we're expecting is for the consumer to look at the privacy policy, make an evaluation of what she wants, decide how much it's worth, make trade-offs. And I think people are just saying, wait a minute, I'm trying to look up a pizza place because I'm starving. <laughs> and you know, I'm just going to click yes so to get to an answer because I need that thing right now. Or the story or of getting the receipt, right? Right. Luigi, or the Luigi, <laughs> <laughs> Luigi was informed yeah. uh, about this, and still he's <laughs> held hostage, right? right? Exactly. And so there are a lot of known biases that people have. And it would be very interesting to interact what we know about all of that with these privacy settings because I just don't think consumers are very good. Moreover, this morning there was a lot of discussion of kids online. I mean, I'm not letting my teenagers make these decisions. They make terrible decisions. Right. Uh, they're not old enough to know what's good for them. They have to be told to eat their vegetables. They probably need to be told uh, some things like this, too. So that that's a, another, another. You think they're paying attention to what you're telling them? Uh, <laughs> and, and I, uh, whole, anyway, and I just think I'm there's sure a lot. I'm sure they of, appreciate all the, uh, yeah, you know, exactly. all the advice that you're, you got. OK. So, so let's talk. I want to add something okay, that, you, you know, and again, I, I think I keep going back to this value creation because there is actually also some value being created with all of this data. The example I want to give is actually uh, Uber Eats. 
So Uber with Uber Eats, what they do is that also they collect data of when do we eat and what do we eat and what do we like. But what they're using they this data for, uh, I don't know if they make if they make teenagers eat vegetables, but what they do is that they actually identify that some markets are short on fried chicken, for example. So they are going to approach a pizza place and tell them, you know what, there isn't a lot of competition in the fried chicken market here. So if you want to start offering fried chicken, this is going to be a good market for you to do that, which is going to increase competition uh, you know, on some level. So I think that there are good uses of data and there are bad uses of data. And I think that it's important to also kind of like, you know, make this distinction, which just makes it obviously way more complex because now when you're ordering your pizza, do I want to share that or don't I want to share it? Because on one hand, it might, it might uh, increase competition, but then on the other hand, they might know whether I like mushroom. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So I just want to come back to like having a stronger point of view on regulation. So I completely agree with Carl. I mean, this is, to me right now, just I would take this view, this should be under consumer protection. I wouldn't go as far as say, I wouldn't go further than that. I just, I mean, they can, they, there can be bad uses of data, good uses of data. We just don't know. But I would impose something under consumer protection. And what we hope is that with the increased transparency that results from that, you will get either people are just going to be creeped out or they're going to turn to alternative services. So it basically makes competition more efficient. And hopefully, that takes care of, of, of some of these issues. OK, so now I want to spend uh, the last leg of the panel on what that regulation, what that consumer protection might look like. Um, yeah. and, then, uh, and then we'll open it up for questions, so prepare. Uh, but OK, so um, let's propose for a second, put away antitrust for a second. I don't necessarily think we need to entirely. but. Um, uh, what does the consumer protection framework look like? Who who administers it, um, and uh, and what do you think the things uh, that have been proposed out there are are strong, and and what hasn't been proposed yet that needs to be? Who wants to take that so first? So I'm not going to opine on who should run it because that's too hard. Uh -huh. uh, but I do have a few favorites. One is I think um, it's been shown in the behavioral literature that defaults really matter. So I think setting the defaults to be, for example, you have to opt in, not that you have to take an affirmative stance to opt out. Uh, that would make a big difference. Uh, I think the consumer owning her data, and in particular being able to receive it in an interoperable form and take it to the competitor or take it to the entrant, I think that's hugely important. So if I like certain foods at certain times of day, uh, or my bank activity, or whatever, to be able to receive that, in a standardized format and take it to the competing bank strikes me as a really important way to incentivize entry and competition. And when you have defaults and uh, opting in to the, um, the consumers, how do we have the consumer understand whether, because I sort of opt in in some ways by clicking uh, terms of service, right? But I so don't really have any Yeah, those terms choice. of service are a really big problem, I think. Yeah. I mean, they're just not feasible to read for regular people. I don't right. know what we're learning from those, really. You don't read them, Carol? <laughs> <laughs> you not read uh, Carl, do you want to take a stab at who or what or both? Well, I'll, I'll take a quick step. First up, it seems like the Federal Trade Commission is a good place to start because they really, that is the agencies that has consumer protection authority. They can do rulemakings if they choose. Which they okay. haven't. Which they have not done, and may, we'll see whether they choose to do so. They have, when Congress set up the FTC in, in 1914, they were serious. They gave them a lot of authority, but a lot of it's been uh, has has been laid foul. Okay. Well, I want to get to okay. whether any of this is going to happen in a second. Okay. I want to a I want to ask what can they done? Let's uh, do. Let's say you are um, uh, czar czar of the uh, FTC. And you throw I'll, I'll out all the other couple things. First of all, I like I think the data portability is good. I think I think you know selling data to third parties like should be pretty hard to do unless the person really approves it. Okay, mm -hmm. I think we, we can probably learn. I know there's been a lot of criticism of the European data data privacy rule. We're gonna hear more about it tomorrow, I think. But you know something there, the notion of ownership and the, the user has more knowledge to find out what the data is and to limit its use. Uh, I think those are all good things. And what about some sort of liability here? Right? Why not liability for breaches and losses of the data that, that maybe there'd be something you know, that could, could be, could be a harsher, a tougher? Do you think Facebook has already violated the FTC consent decree? And could it, uh, 
uh, could the FTC go to a judge now and say, um, uh, you violated um, and we're going to start to fine? I don't, I, again, they were looking into it. I don't know the terms of this consent decree, but I'm talking about, you know, bigger fish than that. That's mm -hmm. backward looking. I'm talking about some, some, some regime that wouldn't apply just to people who entered into a consent decree, right? Mm -hmm. It would be a liability for everybody or a rule that would apply prospectively to everybody. So you've been thinking about, you know, are these technological solutions that you're sort of hoping for, are they, um, are they sufficient or do you think that there should be regulation? What would that look like? So, so I, I actually think that, um, I think that the regulation is one side of it, but I think that education is another side of it. And I think that yeah, just educating, and this is kind of like to Andre's point in terms of what do people understand that they're giving and what they don't understand. And I think that education is going to be a very important part of it. And I think that even when you think about the blockchain technology, um, what the blockchain technology it can do is it, it can actually really give you this uh, you, you know, identity, digital identity that, that uh, we were talking about earlier today. But I think that this digital identity comes with um, lots of, you know, um, responsibility in terms of I need to know that there is just so much data on me that uh, what is the, what, what will happen, you know, so the blockchain technology is supposed to be immutable, okay? Um, but lots of things are supposed to be doing a better job than what they do. So when you get to uh, data breaches, when you're getting to a lot of these data being stored somewhere, um, and then you start ha start thinking about who's going to be responsible for uh, to this information. And if it's the 16-year-old who's been collecting all of these data, you know, through these 16 years, uh, that, that, and now someone is offering them something for this data, I think that um, ed educating consumers in terms of what exactly uh, are the harms to giving this data is going, it, it might be even more important than, and, you know, than antitrust because yes, there are some things that you can do in terms of limiting companies uh, in, in terms of what they can or cannot do with the data. But I think that also making sure that consumers understand what exactly can be done with this data mm -hmm. and what giving this data actually means. And I think that again, the blockchain technology is going to be great in terms of having you own your own data, but it does not solve their problem because even if you own the data but you don't understand what exactly are the implications of giving it, that's going to be to still be an issue. So blockchain isn't just for getting my deliveries of heroin. That's good to know. <laughs> um, uh, Andre and Jay, do you guys want to weigh in on kind of the solu the regulatory solutions? Did you have a? Well, I think that. Okay. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Maybe I mean uh, I think the best solution might be actually a self-regulation by by the industry, but I'm self-regulation. Self-regulation, but I'm not naive enough to to believe that it will happen. Uh -huh. So I think that there's some kind of a regulation is I think inevitable. But I think that I mean industry itself should also I mean try try their best to to self regulate and then uh, in terms of regulation I mean we know that actually in Europe uh, there is a new privacy regulation actually that will be implemented next month and I mean I read some of them I mean then actually I mean it also seems to have some 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 good element I mean for instance one example might be data portability. So in any case, I mean, that is already, I mean, it will be implemented. Now that is now given. And considering that many firms are multinational and all those firms will be actually subject to, to that kind of regulation, I think that uh, uh, the United States should also look at, look at that, that regulation and maybe try to at least try to, to harmonize, to, to, to uh, reduce the burden of the firms. But to, given that data, you were saying data is you know, infinitely replicatable, um, does data portability have to uh, have an element where you say, um, and you, Google, need to uh, delete all my data? Um, and is that workable, or is that uh, um, is there any technological? I know that, that that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. whether there should be some technological, I mean, uh, solution to, to to that kind of problem, mm -hmm. so that actually the all, I mean, as, as as a consumer, you own your own data, 
and actually you can dictate how that it how it can be used. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether there can be some technological solution to, to that. I, I'm not sure. Uh, Andre, do you want to weigh in? Sure. Uh, so I think I broadly agree with what Fiona mentioned. I'll just bring up for the sake of argument. I think it's important to so uh, the the two elements you mentioned were data portability. I I completely agree, and more information. So on data portability, I think. I mean, we can we can have this debate, right? But there's some elements of the data that's being created. I mean, it's not as easy as we think, right? I mean, there's some elements which are clearly mine. Let's if you think about Facebook data, like the names of my friends. But there are other elements of the data which Facebook will argue. Basically, it's data that's completely unique to Facebook. It's been created on Facebook. It's unclear how you assign ownership of the data. So I think it's it's not as I mean, I certainly I would err on the side of giving more control to uh, to users. And by the way, it's not just social networks data. There's another case that I follow closely, was the um, so Equifax breach. So data about credit. So that's another one where consumers actually have no idea what data is going in there. And I think that's egregious. I mean, you basically have no clue how your credit like goes up and down. So I think there should definitely be some, you know, some information, some man mandatory information disclosure for how this data works and, you know, some ownership to consumers. On providing more information, I think I'd just resort to, I don't know, ask, give a math quiz or something to the <laughs> to people before. Like the, the, there's this movie, The Internship, that says you should solve a ma like a hard math problem before you text someone. Just to make sure to prevent the drunk, to prevent on drunk. Facebook test. might drop dramatically. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, that, I, I know that's completely unrealistic. But some sort of education, getting around what you mentioned, the collective action problems. I mean, the fact that I may think, even if I understand what's going on, I may think, you know, just giving my small data for like for ordering a pizza, like who, who cares, right? But that's because I'm ignoring the effects on, on other, like the aggregate effect. So just like making sure that people understand like that this data gets aggregated and it becomes something really powerful is, is very important. Okay, so um, we there's a general consensus that there needs to be some kind of regulation um, here, uh, and I think I, well, that's one of the most surprising things that I've taken from the entire day is that uh, almost everyone, including you know Dennis Carlton, uh, uh, you know embraced some form of regulation. Um, this, we think the agreement is regards Facebook, or is it be is it broader than that? Actually, yeah, fair enough. Uh, I, I think we're all. I think I you're right. We're all thinking you're, about Facebook. You're right. I'm not sure that it extends to which other companies that might extend. I think to. It, it sounded to me like uh, Facebook, yes, Google, probably Amazon. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, lots of data. <laughs> Wait, sorry, I, I understood. Okay, so can we all go around and see what each of us uh, yeah. <laughs> understood? Yeah, because I'm not sure it's the same. And so let's, yeah. let's, 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 yeah. I mean, I think Facebook definitely, Google, I'm open to, but I don't know quite what it would be. But again, I think having control over people's data, that should be general. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah, I mean, I would say it's very confusing to imagine one regulation for one company and yeah. another for another. Mm -hmm. I'd be That's, more yeah, comfortable agreed. with the. We have a blanket. United yeah, we have States a data blanket, 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 blanket policy, yeah. and everyone yeah. complies with it. Uh huh. Okay. So that's, that's what I was. That's, that's that what I was getting at. Yeah. Okay. So the implications might be very, very different for different companies. Right. right. For antitrust, yeah. I'm you know I'm fine going to like there's market, but for this consumer yeah. protection stuff, I think that one I view it as it doesn't matter if it's Twitter or like anyone that basically relies on data, you should be subject to the to these rules. Okay. So the last last topic before I open up for questions is um, what. Uh, so, capture was mentioned maybe once today, political capture. Um, Donald Trump's name was mentioned uh, two or three times. Um, uh, there is this remarkable consensus now forming that these companies are a problem to some extent um, with varying degrees of uh, agreement, Facebook leading um, and data having a problem, but how realistic do we think that there's going to be any regulation um, in any serious way uh, in the foreseeable future and why or why not? Carl. Well, I think what we're, as far as I understand these things, what we're talking about now would require probably some act of Congress. Um, maybe the FTC could have some rulemaking, but I don't know how far that could go. So, so the notion of this current Congress passing a major new form of regulation, given that regulation is essentially a four-letter word, seems pretty damn low. <laughs> Does anyone disagree on the panel? Yeah. Right. So, and um, is it is that ideological or is it um, is it uh, capture? Um, is uh, is con well, you, you said that very quietly. 
<laughs> well, I mean, I, as I said this morning, I think one of the difficulties of coming to solutions like the one sort of this room is, is discussing is that it, the firms who make money off of the status quo will take that money. I mean, there's plenty of economic models explaining this. I have monopoly profit, and I'm willing to spend up to the last dollar of my monopoly profit to protect my monopoly profit. So if I can lobby members of Congress, if I can talk about how great the tech industry is, if I can, you know, there's going to be many uh, uh, strategies like that that will delay or eliminate uh, attempts to make these changes. And so do these Go ahead. Actually, uh, I have one, one, one question. Uh, in the congressional hearing on, on Facebook, actually what caught my attention was uh, Mark Zuckerberg's uh, response to, to, to the possibility of a regulation. Actually, what he said, I mean, he seemed to be actually ready to accept the regulation. But what he said was that actually, well, we can afford to, to adhere to any regulation. We can afford to do that. But uh, regulation, you should not regulate so that to kill uh, Small entry, entry firms. Right. This is a completely opposite to what we think about regulation used by, by big firms, especially oh. Chicago. They, they think that incumbent firms will use actual regulation to kill entrants. Yeah. But I don't know, I mean, what was uh, in, in, in his mind? He seemed to be more care about, about potential entrants rather than Facebook. He seemed to be saying that actually, where Facebook was also a small company years back, so you should not, I mean, use, I mean you, should not, you should be very careful. Uh, not to use regulation. No, I mean, I, to, to, I, I, so I, it was yeah. completely, I mean, I don't know. Which is the rhetoric around regulation in this country is really amusing to watch because it's always presented as firms don't like regulation because they want to, you know, dump pollution yeah. in the river or something like that. I think the opposite is very often true. Firms love regulation because very so. often the regulation keeps the competitors out or yeah. does something very useful. And so I think we really need to be much more nuanced when we talk about regulation. Did you want to add something? Yeah, no. I'm just thinking. You know, when you think about uh, when you think about Facebook, a lot of uh, you, you know when you think about their acquisitions, a lot of what's happening with Facebook is these acquisitions of new technologies, innovations, and so on, which allows them to just pick and choose rather than do it themselves. So they definitely don't want to kill that. So. Um, okay. So let's open it up with, with questions. Uh, the uh, you first, yeah, the lady right there. Yeah. Um. Thank you. That, uh, do you listen? I think. Yeah, yeah. Okay. This is go. a question for Carl and Fiona. Um, <clears throat> if, uh, as an alternative solution, while data regulation of whatever kind comes comes into place, Macon was saying today that there is a consensus between antitrust agencies in terms of protecting consumer welfare, and that uh, basically there's no there's well, no, we don't have any cases because the, the theory of, of, of harm is not clear. There, there's nothing. But my question is, when you talk about consumer welfare, that could be shorted as a lowering prices, or it could be expanded a little bit more in terms of not just lower prices, but also a higher, bigger quantity, higher quality innovation and maybe put into that basket uh, privacy as a quality issue. So then what do you think of an idea of bringing in a case for abuse of dominance in terms of using that privacy data? So then if you have a case like that, uh, one of the remedies could be to the specific companies you're, you're investigating to be a, to give the data to third parties and give it and have it in a, a interoperability way, maybe that could work. So let me just respond. The consumer welfare standard definitely includes quality and innovation and already, privacy for sure. So privacy, to the extent that consumers value that and it's an element of quality, then it's in there already. We can we can. Yeah consider that on just under normal operating procedures would be my, my first response. So then you could have a Facebook case? And that, let mm. me just then say one more thing about data. I think if you consider data to be an asset, like a factory or a truck, uh, you can also deal with data under current law. I mean, if the, if the remedy to the merger is, we, you know, the, the factories 
are going to be combined and that's going to lessen competition, so we want you to divest a factory, you can make the exact same argument with data. Well, for example, you could imagine, I think it would be fine to have a merge. If, if Facebook were doing an acquisition, it could be the theory of harm could be this other company would be putting competitor pressure on them to give more favorable uh, privacy policies to their customers, and those were lost. That would be consumer harm, and that would be a basis potentially for challenge having nothing to do with prices. What, you're, you both are talking about mergers. What about uh, anti-competitive conducts? Well, I think that, that, that there's a distinction here, definitely between the U.S. and the EU. We don't tend to think of simply charging a high price as an abusive monopoly position, exploitative. Okay, but in the European Union, that's a possibility more under the law. And so having, let's say, privacy rules that are really unfavorable to your customers, that'd be like charging a high price, that would not in the US typically be itself an abuse. So when you're getting abuse, it's, my question then would become, what did they do wrong? Yeah. And Here's simply saying, I don't like their privacy policies is not a, a, a sufficient answer. I agree. Here we need an exclusionary conduct. Yeah. Um, all right, uh, why don't we take two questions, Dick and then Austin. I just have a quick comment, and that is, if you're worried about data and who has it, it goes way beyond Facebook, right? Yeah. If you belong to the CVS uh, Extra Care loyalty program, they know everything you bought at a drugstore. Your bank knows uh, every check you've written, if you still write checks. Yeah. Your credit card issuer knows everything you bought, in a, and it goes on. Uber knows where you go. Agreed. So it, the issue of data goes deep in the economy these days. And that, to me, says if you don't want to make a regulatory policy that favors the very large firms, it needs to be pretty simple. And that requires some thought. My, my uh, distant impression of the European uh, directive is it's not simple. <laughs> uh, and U.S. firms will be complying with it if they do business in Europe, and, and that's a cost of doing business. But that may be a cost of doing business that's hard for small firms to bear. So I think in thinking about data policy uh, here, uh, transparency and all that, it's got to be simple or it will entrench the large firms. And I, I totally agree with that. I think one, so one simple rule would be significant liability if you lose my data. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Another would be... No, you cannot you provide my data to any third party unless, you know, I have sworn in blood and I'm somehow informed or something, okay, which could not as simple as I might like, but those are the sort of things I have in mind, not some more complicated thing. Could you, could you use, uh, you, and you may want to have a rule for this too, I don't provide your data, but uh, an advertiser wants to uh, target people with certain characteristics. I will run it through my database, without giving names, That's what they do now. I can target. Now, you may want to opt out of that, too. Well, that gets interesting. The other thing is if you have a rule regarding third parties and you can't cross corporate boundaries, it tends to advantage the larger firms. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think your general point that whatever we do should be really attentive to the competitive implications, not just the consumer protection implications, is a really important principle. Awesome. In a way, the premise of Dick's question first was observation, there are a lot of platforms in the world. They're not just Facebook and Google are platforms. And so my question, I guess it's tilted more toward the antitrust folks. I can see that a series of things are more consumer protection and not really antitrust. But let's think of the bread and butteriest, most antitrust things we have, like mergers, we have a merger guideline, we have consumer welfare standards. Does it matter when platforms go to merge? what the second side of the platform is in the following sense. Apple's a platform. Their other side, they got consumers. Their other side are these app developers. And consumers like apps. So the, to the extent that we're saying there's a consumer welfare standard and they're gonna get monopsony and it's gonna lead to shutting down some of these developers, there's an obvious consumer harm that there won't be as many apps. And maybe you could argue that on Amazon, the, if they have a platform, the other side of their platform are these merchants. But anything that's advertising based, which in our discussion here is all hovering around data on advertising based platforms, I'm confused. I don't exactly know what is the, cons what is the impact of 
Consumers don't like ads. So if I told you we're going to merge to Monopoly and they're going to raise the price of the ads and there will be fewer ads, that's great. in a way, that's good for consumers. <laughs> so I, I, how do we square platforms so, where the other side is negative on consumers? How do we square that with merger guidelines and consumer welfare standards? I think the way they say it is consumers like the ads that they respond to. Namely, you didn't realize you wanted this pair of shoes, <laughs> and now I've shown you this ad for the pair of shoes, and you buy them. That was an ad you wanted to see. And that's better than vinyl siding, which you did not want to buy. Therefore, it's a consumer welfare improvement. That's my loose understanding of how these arguments go. Two reactions off it. First, we have to wait to see what the Supreme Court says in the Amex case, which is going to be very important here on the two-sided analysis, the decisions coming in a month. Second. I'm ruling your question out of order that is proper for the master's class, not for this class. <laughs> <laughs> really complicated. <laughs> um, okay, uh, in back, uh, um, the uh, woman there. Thank you. Um, so I really appreciate your thoughts on you know, where, where are the section two violations? And um, I'm a tech policy fellow with Mozilla and I've been asking that for like the past nine months and getting similar responses. But one of the other responses I get, and I heard this a bit when I took a trip out to the Bay Area and talking to VCs was, you know, these little small startups, if they're faced with like something that one of these companies is doing that's very anti-competitive, they're probably not gonna dwell on it. And they're just gonna move on and find something else. So one, is that a problem? I mean, are they just gonna find innovation elsewhere and so innovation will thrive? Or are we maybe losing out on potential innovation because there is not, um, is it not coming to light? And I guess the third question is, do we need some sort of like pro bono army of lawyers to talk to, to like place in startups to be able to identify, you know, what these, what companies might be doing to kind of shut off this competition before it even gets off the ground? Uh, it's a very good question. You guys should be able to, you know, jump in if you want, but I just elaborate that there is why it's more than anecdotal. It, uh, so patent, uh, uh, patent applications are down. Uh, it looks like small business formation is down. It seems like there's something going on in the economy that might speak to this. Well, I would say, look, if startups and small companies are, are steering clear of some of these giants because they're afraid they'll be squashed through some sort of anti-competitive conduct, that's a concern. Even though they may find some other thing to do, sure, that's a concern. I mean, you're you're reducing competition and innovation in some important space. People said that 20 years ago about Microsoft, okay? And then some people say that now. It happened the same channel already. Yeah, and uh, the, the, the one of the panelists tomorrow is Gary Reback, who's a lawyer who assembled a lot of the small squashed people in the Microsoft uh, case. And so you might want to ask him that question uh, again tomorrow. The, the really hard thing though is distinguish sort of something, well, I. Is there really a case there, or is it just somebody like, well, I didn't like this, that, or the other thing, and they're kind of complaining? It's so hard to know from outside. But you would never be able to, in our framework, you would never be able to make a, uh, a legal case um, where you were a small startup and you say, I decided not to do this, which was going to be a really brilliant idea because of the power of Facebook and Google. We, it's just not feasible, because you could never show that that was going to be a, prof, a profitable. You wouldn't have the emails. You have no ability to discover their evil plans inside um, when you get discovery. So how, so antitrust might, is antitrust asking the wrong questions and, um, and holding itself to some kind of standard that is impossible to prove or demonstrate? And you should be just more aggressive and start blocking It's not the wrong question. Uh -huh. Assembling the evidence, you're right can be challenging. Um, and that's why it usually takes time. And that's why these cases, when they happen, are big, big changes. You know, the Microsoft case is famous. Why? Because it assembled a lot of these theories and evidence in one place, and we learned a lot. Look, the, the um, Congress intended to try to encourage these sort of private cases by having trouble damages in antitrust suits. Okay, so that was a way to encourage it, okay? On the other hand, the Supreme Court over the last 40 years has made it much, much harder for a private plaintiff to bring these cases. So it's very hard for them to do so. I think then we can talk about whether that's, that's a mistake. Do, uh, I'll take Jonathan in a second, but do you guys have anything to add? To I, I just think, you, you know, it applies to any market, right, where you have big players. And just when you think about FinTech, then 
you have all of those small startups that need to compete against the banks, and that's going to be as hard as competing against Facebook or Amazon. Or mm -hmm. so I think that that just kind of like you know, it's a very, it's more you know, it's a general kind of like problem, and I think that innovation just going to end up kind of like we're going to see all of these partnerships, and that, I think that there are solutions to that that kind of like not necessarily going to be antitrust uh, or regulation. Like what? Uh, again, I, I, I think that if you have a good enough, uh, so the, the, the examples I'm thinking about are more from fintech market, mm -hmm. and what you see is that what fintechs are doing is that they are partnering with the banks, meaning that they understand that there are going to be things that they're going to be able to do better than the large companies that are moving slower and there are some um, things that they might not have the expertise in and so on. So, you, you know, where exactly is my added value and where exactly I can actually create something that's going to make them want to work with me rather than just um, imitate me. Okay, John. So would any of you be willing to opine on the issue that Mr. Clemens raised earlier, which is is there a way to modify the Section 230 safe harbor blanket liability protection that allows these companies to do anything they want and claim it's not their fault that horrible things are happening? No. Any, any, any takers? <laughs> no. Well, when you put it that way, it sounds a little overly broad. Yeah. <sighs> Well, I mean, obviously, safe harbor in, 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 in the DMCA is fairly simply defined, right? And, and my sense was it was originally intended for a big network like Verizon, right? There's all bits flowing through it, and they can't, they really don't know what's happening in their thing. But clearly, Facebook, Google, YouTube yeah. have lots so, of editorial function that they perform on the on the content so, that comes through. They don't so allow I, you to see pornography, right? I would okay. say that this is a slightly different topic. That is to say, we've been talking about the user data. This is more about incentives to invest. And if, the, if those investments are expropriated by platforms that don't have to pay for it and so on, then we don't have as much creativity and investment in the economy. That's a, that's a harder one and to totally worth examining, but uh, a different animal. Okay, last question um, over there. Uh, Carl, thank you for teasing local search. I just want to reiterate this as a little bit of a plug because I do think it's a great example of uh, where, where the evidence, the empirical evidence of direct consumer harm is, is sitting out there and uh, we're talking about one and a half billion searches per day. Uh, it, local search is 40% of all, 40% uh, of all search on Google has local intent. And this is consumers trying to figure out what they're, where they're gonna spend their money before they put their phones in their pockets and go offline and transact with Main Street small business owners. And we have direct evidence, of, empirical evidence of Google basically putting its hand on the scale and siphoning users into an inferior experience and increasing search costs. And we've, we've done a, a great workup on that. And so I, I'm curious, like... This is Yelp, right? This, well, Yelp is one of dozens of local search players. Um, so, uh, and, and I would contend that if you could decouple local somehow from Google it, and it all lived under one company, it'd be mentioned in the same breath as Facebook and Amazon. So. Uh, so why not that? Is, you know, what, what do you see as the weakness in, uh, in a local case uh, or the strength in a local case, Carl? Gee, we've run out of time. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll read this quote from Teddy Roosevelt, which was my hope with my last chance. 1910, New Nationalism Speech in Osawatomie, Kansas. Teddy Roosevelt. Combinations in industry are the result of an imperative economic law which cannot be repealed by political legislation. The effort at prohibiting all combinations has substantially failed. The way out lies not in attempting to prevent such combinations, but in completely controlling them in the interest of the public welfare.
That is my answer, sir. All right. Well, uh, on that last dodge, uh, but a wonderful panel. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's take it out and uh, argue it over drinks. Thank you. Please, please join us back for dinner and reception uh, in the same room.